Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait 30 seconds or a minute as people come into the Zoom room. Okay, well, as people are still coming in, I think we have a pretty big crowd for today. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Tova Wang. I am a democracy fellow at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's a really exciting conversation. Um, before we begin um, a few words, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. And to let you know, um, we will be doing, we will have a Q&A at the end, um, at least we'll try for 15 minutes. Um, so anytime during the presentation, you can feel free to um, put a question in the Q&A and we'll be going to those at the end of the session. Um, and then finally, this event is being recorded and will be on the Ash Center website. Um, and it'll be on uh, the YouTube channel as well after the event has concluded. So welcome again. Um, I'm really, really happy to um, have this discussion about a new book by uh, two authors and a third that's not with us, Hari Han, about, um, it's called Prisons, Prisms of the People, Power and Organizing in, 20th, in 21st Century America. Um, and the book will be coming out, I think, in a month or two um, to be determined, but soon. <laughs> I got to read it. Told. <laughs> okay, so I got to read it. So I, I can vouch for it as being a really excellent, interesting, very useful book. Um, and I just want to mention also that it's really special to have um, Liz and Michelle and um, my friends at Lucha on with us. Um, I get to work with these guys pretty much on a daily basis as part of a different project called DPI but with very similar missions, which is connecting and co-constructing uh, research, research and projects and solutions um, with organizers and scholars together to um, kind of work on issues as a team. Um, and I, I see that as also the um, a part of the ASH mission as well. So um, we're really glad to be coming together here today. Um, so let me introduce each of the panelists and I wanna just, they might seem a little bit long, but I thought it was really important for you to know a little bit of the background, particularly of um, Tomas and Alex. So I'm just gonna start and I'm sorry if they're a little bit long. Um, so Alejandra Gomez was born in Pomona, California to immigrant parents. She began her career in community organizing in 2007 during the beginning of Sheriff Joe Arpaio's racially charged criminal suppression sweeps that targeted immigrant communities. Seeing the fear and harassment her community was experiencing that was reminiscent of her own childhood, Alejandra began working with Maricopa, Maricopa Citizens for Safety and Accountability to organize against Sheriff Arpaio after his and his unfair uh, practices. Since her start in organizing, Alejandra has focused her work on immigration rights through large-scale civic engagement efforts to bring out the Latino vote and direct action. Alejandra was the field manager for the Adios Arpaio campaign that registered over 30,000 Latinos to vote. Rooted in her family's immigration struggle, Alejandra led the organizing efforts in the fight for DAPA and expanded DACA at United We Dream National Network as the deputy organizing director. Currently, Alejandra serves as a co-executive director for the Arizona Center for Empowerment. And then we have her uh, partner, uh, uh, Thomas Robles, um, who serves as the co-executive director of the Arizona Center for Empowerment. Tomas became involved in grassroots organizing and activism after SB 1070, which some of you will remember, an anti-immigration bill that legalized racial profiling in Arizona, uh, and that was passed. Tomas became a community organizer in 2010, helping to promote civic engagement and comprehensive uh, immigration reform. Since then, Tomas has worked with various organizations working for different causes, such as immigrant and worker rights, veterans issues, and housing discrimination. Tomas is the son of Mexican immigrants and was born in Tucson, Arizona and raised in Phoenix. He is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps and is a graduate of Arizona State University with a Bachelor of Arts in, Transport in Transborder Studies with an emphasis on immigration policy and economy. And then we have the two authors of the book. Um, first, Michelle Oyakawa, um, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Muskingum University in Ohio. 
Um, she studies the intersection of race, religion, and social movements through her research on leaders and organizations. And she is, as I said, the co-author of Prisms of the People and has written um, several other um, works, including uh, Black Ministers and Mobilization in the 21st Century. And then finally, Liz McKenna. Um, she's a, pox, a postdoctoral scholar at the uh, Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. And she studies left and right wing political organizing in the United States and Brazil, using multiple methods to examine when civil society organizations safeguard against authoritarianism and when they become the primary carriers of it. She is the co-author of two books on grassroots organizing, the one that we're gonna talk about today, and another great book that I recommend called Groundbreakers, How Obama's 2.2 Million Volunteers Transformed Campaigning in America. Um, and then at the, the very end, we're gonna have uh, the Q&A from Yasmin Serrano Munoz, who um, is in the Harvard Kennedy School MPA program and is also concurrently pursuing her MBA at Wharton. And we should all congratulate her because she's, um, she's actually graduating this month. So, all right, so let's go get started. I'm gonna um, shoot a question at each of um, the panelists and, um, and then we'll go to a, a more uh, group Q&A. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna start off with turning it over to Liz to um, start us off with an overview of the book itself and sort of the, the framework that we're looking at organizing in the book. Great. Tova, thank you so much. Thank you to the Ash Center for hosting us and for everyone who is on this call today. It's really exciting to see um, all of the people in the room virtually. Um, so as Tova said, um, Michelle and I and our esteemed colleague Harihan, political scientist, um, have a book coming out. We, it was due to be published in December, but COVID delays have pushed it back to June and now July, we think, but we're excited to give you an over, a overview of the book right now, and then most excited about having two protagonists in one of our main case studies on the call with us, Alex and Tomas. So I'll do a 10 minute overview, and then we have 15 minutes for Alex and Tomas to tell their story. And then Michelle is gonna walk us through um, the highlights of the cases that we weren't able to cover. So here is uh, the book cover, very uh, our Pink Floyd aesthetic. It's called Prisms of the People, Power and Organizing in 21st Century America. And the question that we asked in this book, which we started research for in sort of the depths of despair of the fall of 2016, um, was how do organize, organizations build and exercise political power given the improbability of their work? And so we set out to answer this question sort of in, in response to, of course, everything that was going on in the world, uh, the kind of global illiberal right wing authoritarian tilt, um, and also in response to a long line of research, which um, we kind of think of as the status quo bias. And so to start, I'm, I've got this table here from um, Frank Baumgartner, political scientist and colleagues, ran a study published in 2009, where they wanted to understand whether or not there was any way to predict which kinds of resources um, predicted the outcome of congressional bills and policy passage. So they got about 500 bills, and then they tallied up before the, before the votes were tallied up, which side of either the proponents or opponents of the bill um, controlled greater resources. And the list of the table here are the different types of resources they looked at. So high-level government allies, um, mid-level government allies, lobbying officials, lobbying expenditures, membership, so people, which side had more people, campaign contributions, and so forth. Um, and I'm going to ask a little bit of audience participation in the chat to see before I show the results, who, uh, which of these resources do you think was most predictive of uh, winning on policy passage? This is the at the national level, by the way. So just chat to the panelists. All right, I'm going to read these out because I know not everyone can see it, but we have some votes for lobby expenditures with three dollar signs. We've got one vote for mid-level government allies, another vote for lobbying. Another vote for lobbying, more lobbying, campaign contributions. Okay, business is another one we've got. All right, so sounds, oh, and we've got one vote for membership. So more, pe oh, and then we've got uh, a hope a hope for people, a hopeful vote cast for people as well. Uh, so I know not everyone can see these in the chat, but this is a really good uh, kind of national experiment here. Okay, so the answer is um, most predictive were these top three. So 78% of the time, the side that had more high level government allies prevailed, followed by covered officials lobbying and then mid-level government allies. 
Now, the sobering finding from this study, this bottom half of the table, is that only half the time, so a flip of the coin, did the side with greater um, members, people, actually win. So that's just a numerical count. Um, or the side with even lobbying expenditures and even, and even um, money as well. So for all of those who voted about lobbying and, and money, um, it turns out that the side that spends more doesn't necessarily always win. It's only 50% of the time. So that's what we mean when we say the status quo bias is that um, the work is quite improbable. And then you see this image here, even when there are more people, so even when there are more you know, quantitative mem members on one side, they don't necessarily outweigh the status quo bias. So that was our question. The way we went about uh, researching it was to identify cases that fall in this table, the, the low resource, high power box. So what do we mean by that? Um, the we can think of lots of organizations that don't have very many resources, traditional resources, and also don't exercise much political power. It's also possible to think of sort of that off diagonal organizations with a great high number of resources. So probably all of those resources on the table and also exercise high degree of political power. So the, fo the photo here is from a new book that just came out by Matt Lacombe about the NRA and how the NRA turned gun owners into a political force. So they have lots of people, an extremely well-organized base, and they also have high level government connections. More interesting from a theoretical and a practical perspective are the cases that fall in these off diagonals. So uh, organizations that actually do have access to a lot of resources. This is a picture of um, designed to represent um, Theda Scotchpool's research on highly resourced uh, environmental movement organizations. So she wrote a piece in 2013, observing that there are a number of green organizations, environmental groups that have access to huge war chests and yet exercise little power. But our interest was in this upper right-hand corner. So organizations that had traditionally fewer resources and yet were able to exercise a high degree of political power. So examples of scholarship in this tradition are Elizabeth Clemens' The People's Lobby. Um, she studies in this book, among other things, the women's movement, um, which even before they had the right to vote, so they weren't even enfranchised political actors, they were able to exercise significant political, legis political and legislative power. And then a book by one Marshall Gans, um, Ash Center scholar and Harvard Kennedy School lecturer, who is on this call. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Marshall, who wrote of among uh, among other pieces of um, research on the United Farm Workers Movement, the book called Why David Sometimes Wins. So how was it that the UFW was able to outmaneuver and outorganize the their far better, better resourced counterparts, the Teamsters? The spoiler alert, uh, uh, the title of his 2000 AJS article is resources and resourcefulness. So our, our curiosity was, could we identify contemporary movements and cases that fell in that box and identify commonalities? So to get some analytic leverage around it, the way we, I, the way we designed the research was um, to pick cases in the United States um, that operated in different political contexts. And this was in response to a large body of scholarship about the structural determinants of when movements succeed or fail. So in so sociology, it's called the political opportunity structure um, literature. And we wanted to choose cases that were not necessarily operating all in favorable terrain, external terrain, because then we would simply be able to say that perhaps they won, perhaps they shifted power because of those external factors, as opposed to something that they did, some kind of agentic and strategic choices that they made. So we landed on these four states as our core cases. The purple dot here is, is designed to represent what they were at the time considered, most of them were considered um, swing states or almost swing states. Uh, here's a quick uh, reminder of what the political landscape presidential vote looked like in our six states. So we had four core cases and two um, shadow cases, extension cases. So we're really excited to hear about this particular first panel about Arizona. It's this remarkable story that Alex and Tomas will talk us through going from a state that was um, pretty, pretty red for many, many years. And then, um, of course, flipped in 2020. But we also wanted to vary other factors that sometimes are attributed or given the attribution for why movements succeed or fail. So things like population growth, diversity of the population, economic factors, 
the density of civic organizations and union member rates. So again, we wanted to find states that were or cases that were operating in really vastly different um, political and economic environments. This is known as sort of a most different case selection strategy. So we could control for that. That was the background on the study. And then our first step, because we were looking for cases of success, outliers, um, movements that were able to kind of buck the trend, the status quo bias, we had to demonstrate and figure out ways we could actually measure power shifts. So I'm only gonna give one example in this section. Um, and uh, Michelle is gonna walk us through the other cases. And then of course, Alex and Tomas will tell the story of Arizona. But the one example I'm gonna give here is the case that we studied in Virginia. Um, which was a rights restoration campaign. So up until recently, Virginia was one of only four states in the nation that permanently disenfranchised people with a felony record. And the group that we were studying there, New Virginia Majority, built a multiracial base um, and pressured the governor, two, two subsequent governors, so um, in a row, and finally Terry, Terry McAuliffe, who you see here, um, who ended up reenfranchising one by one um, all of formerly incarcerated people who had, who had been permanently disenfranchised. So that was their win. And we wanted to go beyond just kind of a visible policy win because this, um, as we know, power operates in multiple at multiple levels in dynamic ways and not always in the most visible ways. So they had a policy win, but that wasn't enough. So we just we figured out other ways or other methods by which we could measure power shifts. So in the case of Virginia, what we did is we fielded a, a network survey of all of the Virginia House delegates. And we asked them, we gave them a list of organizations that operate in the state and asked them a series of questions from which we built these network maps. So one of the questions was, with which groups um, listed here, do you have you experienced any form of opposition? So what this very, very sparse network map is telling you is that only Delegate 10, this goldenrod one right here, identified about five groups from which he or she had experienced opposition. Um, this other group over here identified two groups, and then Delegate 8 uh, identified the Virginia Teachers Association. But the vast majority of respondents in our survey um, just basically didn't cite any groups for that. But more interesting to us were questions that we asked about um, strategy. So we asked with which organizations in the state do you strategize? And here the network map looks a lot denser. So this meant that the delegates were citing organizations listed on the right um, as being organizations with which they um, strategized. And New Virginia Majority ranked fifth in terms of its eigenvector value, which is a measure of influence and in network analysis behind national organizations. So the Sierra Club, Planned Parenthood, the largest union in the state, the Virginia Teachers Association, the League of Conservation Voters. So this was surprising to us. Um, well, could be surprising um, on the face of it because New Virginia Majority was a small organization, less than seven years old, had a much smaller budget as compared to all of these other organizations listed above it, and only had, I think, four or five staff members, full-time staff members at the time. So this was one of the ways we went about measuring power shifts beyond just the visible win. And we did that in different ways in each of the cases. So how do we answer that question? Now, this picture on the left looks a lot more um, promising. We've got the people who are finally outweighing um, the elephant money bags over here on the left. And this analytic step in our project um, took us to ask, OK, well, what are the commonalities? What do the groups across all of these states working in different environments, building durable political power beyond just um, visible wins have in common. And we developed the metaphor, the kind of central metaphor of the book, which is the prism. And in the book, the prism is the organization. And so the idea here is that organizations take in resources, be it money, people, um, or any resources of a community that we can think about, including allies, including um, elected officials and allies and make strategic choices about how they're going to design their internal prism. So there are consequences to how organizations uh, decide to allocate resources, for example. And then as a function of that, they refract power outward in this sort of rainbow, the rainbow refraction of, of light is, represents the kind of external manifestation of their power. So that's the sort of central idea behind the prism metaphor. And the strategic logic of it is that um, as follows this kind of four step process that I'm going to go through briefly before I turn it over to Alex and Tomas. But the kind of underlying premise is that movements work in uncertain contexts, 
Um, this means that no amount of resources can necessarily guarantee success, and all of the movements in our cases recognize that. Second, uh, we found that all of the leaders and organizers and member leaders in our case were not necessarily in interested primarily in an immediate visible win. So um, rather, their priority was maximizing the set of strategic choices that they could make. So how many different opportunities and different ways they could go about maneuvering in a situation was their primary interest, not necessarily the bill passing um, or the elected official falling. And we can think of a couple of examples of this. Um, I think Alex and Tomas will talk us through it. But for example, in 2012, um, the movement in Arizona sought to oust Joe Arpaio and failed in 2012 before um, winning again in 2016. And it, the, the way in which they um, the way in which they built the campaign in 2012 redounded to the campaign in terms of capacity four years later. And then finally, um, to maximize the strategic choice set, we found that all of the groups needed a constituency that had four key characteristics. The, char the characteristics were that the base was independent, meaning not beholden to some external actor's assessment of their value, whether it's an elected official or an ally in DC or a philanthropist. The bases were both flexible and committed, I'll talk through an example of that. And then they were populated by distributed strategists. So strategy was diffused throughout the base and organization. Um, as I said, I'll go through this very quickly, just so to, to get clarifying the concepts, and then I'll turn it over to Alex and Tomas. But what do we mean by a base that is independent or has an independent source of power? So on the left, is a network map um, from our Ohio case that Michelle will talk through a little bit later. The green node in the middle is um, the executive director of the anchor organization, Amos, that we were studying there. And he was involved in a pretty big um, internal coalition fight with business leaders, with uh, the superintendent of the public schools and other city elite in Cincinnati. Um, arguing on behalf of his base that about the specific tax mechanism that they were going to use to fund universal preschool, which was sort of the central uh, theme of that case. And he wrote in his weekly reflection, he turned over his weekly reflections for, I think, uh, three years of three years worth of weekly reflection data, which is really um, great from a research perspective to understand sort of what was going through his mind as a social movement leader at that time. And he wrote this in February at sort of the height of the campaign, where he was um, pushing back against the business elite about the specific mechanism that they'd use to fund preschool. And a business leader pulled him aside and asked him, aren't you afraid you're going to make people angry? And he wrote in his weekly reflection, I quickly said no. I later realized why I could answer so quickly, because of where my power comes from. Most people in the room from the Chamber of Commerce have power that is vested in and determined by their proximity to wealth and power via corporate leadership. They have to make certain trade-offs with their source of power, which means that they have to be careful what they say and how they say it, lest someone get upset with them and upset their career and livelihood. With organizing, our power does not come from networking or proximity and access to people of wealth and influence. It comes from a base to whom we are accountable. So this is an illustration of what we mean by building a base that is independent and not beholden to external assessments of power. And Michelle will give another example later. Uh, second, the, the characteristics of having a base that is both committed and flexible, we can illustrate through our Minnesota case. Um, Faith in Minnesota is the name of the organization there that ran a campaign in 2018 to influence the outcome of a gubernatorial election in the state. And so what this meant is they actually um, equipped members of their base to become DFL, Democratic Party delegates, and cast their vote at the primary, primary kind of caucus election that I said, you know, Michelle will again talk us through the details of that. But the key point here is that those 150 people, members of Isaiah Faith in Minnesota's base, went into the caucus supporting different different candidates. Um, they did not all agree necessarily on whom they wanted to vote for. There were four or more gubernatorial candidates that Faith in Minnesota um, members backed. But they realized that if they were going to act together as a collective and not kind of respond to each of these candidates trying to pick them off individually and actually exercise power as a collective, they had to all stand together. And indeed, 100% of them chose to back the same candidate and were decisive in her winning the caucus. 
And finally, strategy we found across all of the cases was not concentrated in a single kind of genius general official um, at the top of the organization, but was rather distributed throughout. And this data, again, come from Faith in Minnesota, Isaiah. Um, it is network data based on a campaign that they ran in 2019, where you have in the middle the uh, organizer on staff, Vivian. The purple nodes surrounding her are the super leaders. Um, I think there is actually an Isaiah super leader on this call. I noticed just uh, based on the, based on their name in the chat. But these kind of intermediate tiers of leaders were then able to strategize, equip, and develop what they call democracy builders, shown as the blue nodes, in just a month. And then finally, um, when it when it was time for them to mobilize around the election, those democracy builders strategized, engaged, and mobilized more than 2,000 voters in that particular municipal election. So the idea here is that um, Vivian, the staff organizer, was not necessarily the one kind of uh, doing all of the strategizing throughout, but rather was devolving that um, through various subsequent intermediate tiers of leadership, and this data demonstrates that. Okay, so that is sort of the, the final piece of my overview. I apologize for going a few minutes over here. Um, I'm actually just going to flip forward a little bit because I don't want to lose any more time from um, Alex and Tomas's bit. And if we have time, we'll, we'll go back to the other slides that I just flipped through very quickly. Um, but here's the quick summary and conclusion is that we found that the organizations across all of our cases shared key, those four key characteristics. They were independent, committed, flexible, and populated by relationally connected network of member strategists. And the key takeaway here that we found is that Building constituency internally and exercising power externally operate in mutually reinforcing ways. Um, and I really look forward to hearing now from Alex and Tomas, who will tell us the story of Arizona in depth. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be on here with you all. And as I'm Seeing all of the questions from my teacher and organizing Marshall Gans, I'm a little bit nervous, <laughs> so but also excited. Um, buenos dias a todos. My name is Alejandra Gomez, co-executive director of Arizona Center for Empowerment and Living United for Change in Arizona Lucha alongside of Tomas. And as Tova was sharing, my entry point into organizing and my entry point into the political arena was because of a set of experiences that I had as a child. So not your traditional um, entry point into democratic politics, but shaped by um, real challenges and struggles that I lived firsthand through my father's experiences and experiences as a um, undocumented immigrant in California. I just remember my father bringing us into the living room um, and sharing with the family, I am going to be detained or deported if we do not leave California. And as a child listening to that, um, and wondering, you know, what's gonna happen to your hero. Um, as a family, we decided that it was time to leave. And when we came to Arizona, what we found was much of the same. And so now as an adult faced with the same type of anti-immigrant sentiment that we were experiencing in California, what I learned then is that you can't run from bad politicians you can't run from bad policy and that you have to lean in and find your people and fight. But the stakes are different when you're someone that has lived through a particular experience um, because so to speak, right, you have more skin in the game um, because you have lived firsthand that pain. And so for my family, um, when our Pios started doing the raids uh, in the workplace here, when our Pios started doing checkpoints on the street, and um, I now knew that I wasn't the only person in the community that was experiencing this, um, I found myself with a clipboard in hand and fists up marching uh, at the Capitol. And that's where I also um, found my people. <clears throat> that is where I met Tomas. 
And since that moment, our organization has dedicated itself to finding other people in the community, building relationship with people that have had these sets of experiences, whether it be immigration or we like to think often that uh, communities that are or have experienced issues um, within immigration, that that's their only singular issue. But that's not the truth, right? The truth is that healthcare, um, access to healthcare, um, inability to uh, put food on the table um, with so many other issues are the realities that our communities are facing um, in addition to their status. And so for us, it was important to build an organization that was responsive to all of these issues, but where we can also create a political home. And so though Lucha was not um, where I started, it is where I continue building and where we continue inviting our communities to join us in action so that we can continue building. And I think what we now have is because we believed in our work and we centered a couple of things, we believed in redefining power. What does power mean to us? Because it is not 50 plus one. Um, centering relationships and leadership development so that we can continue passing the torch as we continue to build power, we needed to be able to have the staff people to help those in governing. We needed to be able to move organizers into governing, um, but be able to maintain the infrastructure that we built within the state. Um, and then also politicians are not the litmus of our power. Our role as organizations are to contest for power. So for us, it is to be able to have a co-governing approach. And then also, as we're uncovering and we're having this conversation about data, I think what I will bring into this is our community has been oppressed for so long um, and there is significant inequity, but the dominant culture defines how we research, how we measure data. And often the sets of data and the way that we research are responsive to the dominant culture, but not how we actually need to go out and speak in very nuanced and culturally responsive ways to communities that have been disenfranchised over generations. And so with that, I will pass it over to Tomas. Thanks, Alex, and hello and good, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, Tomas Robles, co-executive director of East and Lucha. Um, my upbringing was similar as we, I was born in, in Tucson, Arizona and grew up actually in a border town the first few years in uh, a town that before Google Maps existed, you couldn't find on a regular map, which is Naco, Arizona. And so my story is, is little with family members and I experiencing racial profiling, um, especially down at the border. Uh, border Patrol was there at all times it has jurisdiction over every uh, law enforcement organization because they're within a hundred miles of the border. And so for us, uh, daily occurrence was dealing with, with you know, being seen as the other. And so the most, the most um, glaring example that has, you know, formed my activism and, and organizing the, through the years was uh, when I was young, I was 12, we were driving from visiting family in Naco at the border and driving to Phoenix. And then we were, we got two pull, we, we were broken down because we had two flat tires um, on the road of the city called Marana. And so at the time it was 94, so no cell phones, we couldn't reach out to anybody. And after about an hour in the middle of a June summer, um, a police officer pulled over from behind. And so as a 12 year old, you're taught, you know, police are the good guys, they're going to, He's going to find a way to help us, something like that. And so what ended up happening is that he ended up accusing my dad of having weapons or drugs in the car. And um, despite the fact that we're a family of uh, five, the police officer thought we were criminals. And so without a warrant, without even asking, he pulled my dad out of the car and forced him to put his hands on the hood. Um, in the middle of summer, a steel car at 106 degrees can cause burn. So that's actually what happened to my dad's hands. And then 
Um, without a warrant, he went to the trunk and searched our car and found nothing but made a mess. And the whole time I'm staring at him and I'm a 12 year old. So I'm, this is actually, I'm actually reflecting on this and, and processing as it's happening, but I don't know what to say. After the cop finds nothing, he doesn't apologize, doesn't ask if we need help or water. He just gets in his car and he leaves. And so we're still stranded there, but now feeling like we were just made, uh, we were just criminals in the state and not actual residents. And so that really stuck with me in 2010, until 2010, when SB 1070 passed. And then my experience became not just the law of the land, but also encouraged that, you know, profiling like this happened. And so um, 2010, we began organizing. I met Alex and we started really forming a new world of Arizona so that we could prevent SB 1070 from happening again. And as we began to organize, as we began to, to do leadership development, um, we found ourselves <clears throat> consistently fighting immigration and anti-immigrant bills at the legislature. And we knew this was not sustainable. It wasn't sustainable for us to only be on the defense every single year. And so <clears throat> the building out of deep relationships, the leadership development that we needed, because for us, we were brand new to organizing and so were thousands of people. So we knew that in order for us to continue this movement, we would need to organize ourselves out of the job that we currently had and put new people in place. And when Alex, Alex and I eventually met up again after 2012, and, uh, to form Lucha, we finally had an opportunity to build out an organization in the vision that we saw and that we were experiencing through our work with other nonprofits. But we also could build it in the vision we felt was most conducive to this new way of doing it because the old way of organizing for us was no longer cutting it. And we needed to ensure that we found a way to take care of our staff and our members as well as we. Um, as, you know, with as much grit and as much passion as we did working 12 to 16 hour days, registering people to vote and getting them organized. And then from Lucha's perspective, we also saw that immigration, while a flagship issue, wasn't the most important issue to our communities. It took listening sessions and also taking a step back and realizing as Lucha is like, we don't always have to work on immigration just because we're from Arizona. We can work on the economic justice issues that are happening in our state, that are happening in our communities. And these day-to-day -day conversations led us to really see how can we affect change at the state level if we don't have to what traditional folks would think of power, which is a progressive majority um, in our chambers. And so we knew that there's no way for us to get a majority at this moment at the state legislature. Even if we did, we wouldn't have the level of progressive elected officials yet to be able to pass really progressive policies. And the third part is, well, we do have one option in the state, and that is changing policy at the ballot, which meant a whole new endeavor for us, which meant that as two leaders of color building out a multi-million dollar campaign, that not only was it going to get people excited at the level that we did not expect, but we also got opposition from those that are, from those that claim to be on our side because we were dreaming too big for, our, for in their minds, our state. And so it really tested our notion of how it is that we organize by building up these leaders and putting them in, in positions to succeed, but also taking risks when we're told we're not to. And so in 2016, we started to form a plan to really put the put Arizona upside down. And that is, we wanted to run our own ballot initiative. And so we ran the Prop 206 ballot initiative, which would uh, which was to raise the minimum wage. At that time, it was $8.90. Um, we wanted to raise it to $12 by 2020. And then we wanted to include five days of earned sick time. And we started with that notion and we started really organizing around those issues and it really started to come out in terms of people were now overtaking the politicians that were saying, don't do this or don't work on this. And at the same time, we decided we're still going to take out our pile. And so I'll pass it back to Alex to talk about how we were able to balance the Arpaio campaign and Prop 206 and then 
after those, how we move forward to keep building four years later after that, I guess. Thank you so much, Thomas. Always heart-wrenching to hear your story and what your dad had to go through. Um, what, what we did in 2016 was um, extremely exhausting, but we knew, and the thing that we kept telling ourselves is that we have to stretch. We have to stretch because the moment calls for it. And so what we did was we decided to build up two organizations at the same time, um, Ace and Lucha. And we were going to um, run a ballot initiative, uh, which was Prop 206, to be able to basically learn um, the process of running a ballot initiative and keep that intelligence in-house so that we can replicate it with our leaders. While we were also, um, what we learned during the Adios Arpaio campaign, this is before the Basta Arpaio campaign, the Adios Arpaio campaign is that we registered 34,000 people. We were able to get our communities onto the permanent early voting list. And that year, Helen Purcell, which was the then county recorder, threw out 180,000 provisional ballots. Arpaio that year won by 80,000 votes. Arpaio would have been gone that year, but due to the systemic voter suppression and the targeting of Latino surnames at the county recorder, um, our communities had to again face another uh, um, more time with Arpaio in office. And so we said once and for all, knowing these numbers that we can actually um, drive people to vote, that we can um, now scale our and scale our efforts in our civic engagement work through the coalitions that we had built. Um, we decided to also build up the um, Basta Arpaio campaign. And so we created another C4 with a set of um, other two organizations because the moment was such an important moment. And that year in 2016, we had incredible victories. We increased the minimum wage. We ousted our Arpaio at the ballot box and we were able to get rid of Helen Purcell and elect Adrian Fuentes. And so the short term um, focus on, on the electoral outcomes were based on long-term analyses that we had done, that we needed to expand the electorate and that we needed to pay attention to certain offices, which in this case were the county um, recorder's offices. And then also that we needed to be able to circumvent the legislative process that was blocking our community from being able to move forward with legislation. But the country had a national fallout with electing Trump. And so as we're starting to see gains in the state because of the engagement of our communities, because of the politicizing of our communities, um, what we started to see nationally is that, you know, there we were not having the same outcomes. And so all of that to say that for us, it was also a very strategic and important decision to have a co-directorship because it allowed us to scale. And most of our organization has a co-structure to the directors um, so that we have thought partners, so that we also are able to um, increase the output because we're building up two organizations at the same time, which are separate but sister organizations. Um, even though we're C4 fronting. And so this allows us to, now we are going to open up a new office in Cochise County, which we are so excited. That is a fourth office of Lucha in a short amount of time because we needed to be able to expand out of Maricopa County and be able to engage in statewide discourse around the issues that are affecting our communities. Because we believe in being able to engage our communities um, from the bottom up 
to make sure that our community's um, policy priorities are reflected when we're building um, out our legislation at the, at the Capitol. Thank you guys so much. I think we're going to turn to Michelle to just give us a few quick highlights of some of the other organizations that are studied in the book that are great examples of what, what they're talking about. Sure, thanks. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just really quickly going to go through some of the highlights of our other cases and then, you know, of course, feel free to ask us to expand in the Q&A session. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so New Virginia Majority. Um, this is the one where we were looking at ongoing efforts to restore voting rights to returning citizens. Um, and in this case, we looked in particular at how the organization kind of was strategically using both an inside game and an outside game um, to influence state legislators. So we interviewed legislators and their allies and conducted a network survey. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, okay. So Amos Project is. Uh, uh, in Ohio, this is one where we were looking at um, a preschool promise ballot initiative, uh, issue 44. This was a mun municipal levy to fund universal preschool and K through 12 education. Um, basically passing this meant raising taxes in a conservative area. So that was one of the kind of interesting things about this campaign. Uh, we did a network survey to track change and influence among business and community leaders over the course of the campaign. Um, and this just shows the change over time. Uh, so in our network survey, we looked at, uh, you know, who is, who is strategizing with whom. Um, so in 2013, Amos, uh, our, our case organization is, you know, green dot, so kind of on the outside of the network. Um, and then, uh, you know, in 2016, they had uh, in part, in large part through efforts uh, by their executive director to kind of build out their base and build his network of relationships, uh, they moved more into the center of, of strategy for, um, you know, for, for all of the kind of entities that we interviewed. Okay, next slide. All right, and then our final case was Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota. Um, Isaiah is 501c3, Faith in Minnesota 501c4. So, um, you know, like Alex was talking about, that can be a strategic kind of um, configuration for organizations to have. Um, the Faith Delegate campaign uh, that we looked at mobilized leaders to caucuses for the 2018 gubernatorial, gubernatorial primary. Um, and their goal was to have the candidates adopt the faith agenda that the base had decided on together. So in this one, we measured the power shift by looking at governor candidates rhetoric, um, and we did this through Twitter. Um, what we were interested in, in seeing is, you know, were Isaiah leaders able to influence uh, these, these candidates, these governor candidates to kind of adopt Isaiah's language? So next slide, please. Um, and so this shows that, um, uh, so we looked at certain words that are really common that Isaiah uses a lot, like abundance, dignity, um, and uh, we counted how many times candidates use those words in tweets. Um, and during the kind of primary season, the candidate that uh, Isaiah was, or that Faith in Minnesota was supporting was Erin Murphy, and she used the language um, a really good amount. I would also point to the general election. So Aaron Murphy ended up losing the primary. Um, but, uh, you know, Isaiah's influence was still certainly uh, visible and measurable in the general election as well in terms of influencing. Um, one of Isaiah's goals was to make sure that um, candidates addressed uh, race uh, as well as class. Um, and so we were interested in seeing the extent to which they were able to do that. Um, and just to kind of get at something that um, Alex mentioned as well, there is a challenge associated with um, our organizations trying to work through these things uh, uh, and, and build power. And that is the fact that they are working within a system of, of organizations that make that can make it difficult. Right. So this is a quote from uh, Doran Schranz, who's the executive director of Isaiah. I'm of the opinion that there's not going to be a significant people powered independent movement funded by foundations. It's just that the philanthropic world has its own momentum and its own set of priorities. The things that's depressing is that you take some of your most talented organizers and you turn all their strategic energy on milking that thing, the world of philanthropy.
therapy. And then that thing can also defang you. It turns you into a celebrity, turns you into into a commodity. So I've also seen that happen to people that they do really good organizing that becomes this big thing. And then you get positioned inside that whole system. And all of a sudden you could raise $10 million because you're the new celebrity. So then you build a big national thing and now you're a hustler. I mean, you hustle and broker, but the minute you float up into that thing and you get ungrounded from the base, you turn into something different and you're still dependent on the base, but instead of it being an authentic relationship, you're essentially buying it. Right. So throughout our work, we found a lot of ways in which organizations are kind of under pressure to behave in ways that are, um, you know, counter to building the kind of base that we that we think, um, you know, helps them to build power. Um, And so that is an ongoing challenge for for these organizations. Um, And that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much. And I wanna go straight to um, Q&A because we have a lot of great questions, but I just wanna make a note of one thing, which is since I I do, I am in the world of Agora a little bit and Ash, (laughs) this is such a great example of the ways in which um, scholars and organizers and other types of practitioners can collaborate and co-construct research that can help organizers on the ground to shift power. Um, And it's something that we can uh, do going forward. And also we'll look at, at the different types of metrics we can use to evaluate shifts in power and measure shifts in power other than, you know, email lists and how many people you have on an email list or the number of voter registration forms you collected. And I think that's really important to do going forward. So I'm now going to ask Yasmin to um, take on the Q&A. Sure, thank you. So, look at, so if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A chat and I'll read you from there. Uh, one of the questions that come up, came up is, what can large bureaucratic organizations learn from social movements and community organizations? And this goes to um, any other speakers. Alex or Tomas, do you wanna respond? Yeah, can I repeat the question? So what can large bureaucratic organizations learn from grassroots organizations? Yes. Okay, awesome. Whew, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> So the the challenge often is I'll I'll state the kind of like problem and then I'll shop it over to Tomas. But for me, in working with organizations that either have a massive bureaucracy are part of um, are part of kind of like the the status quo operating um, or have a service orientation and take government contracts, um, often are very risk adverse. And because of um, that risk aversion, what we often find is that there is an upholding of the status quo, right? They don't want to get involved in um, getting very political, often will not engage with community organizations like ours. And so I think the first lesson is that we are not going to be able to service our way out of the challenges and the oppression um, that our communities are facing. And we are going to have to take political stances um, and or have an open door um, policy and engage with each other Particularly, I don't know if this happens in other states, but this is a challenge that we're facing in Arizona where a lot of these institutions um, do not see grassroots partners, particularly because they are a people of color led as strategic. Yeah, I think the, the pen, uh, Marshall Gantz, is, Professor Gantz is quote on resources versus power. It's when, when as a large organization, when that when your dependence on your resources is usually corporations and government funding, you now have limited yourself on how much you can actually push on the system. If you're being fed by the system, you're choosing, you're going to choose not to, you know, disrupt that resourcing. And so for us, it's really about calling to the history of those larger bureaucratic organizations um, on what they used to stand for um, and calling out the fact that they've gone to a model that is very much capitalistic in terms of 
we're going to build it as a business instead of a, a community organization. And so for us, it's really about deciding who we work with and who we not, but never shying from who we are genuinely, which is an organization meant to disrupt. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, this question is for Alyssa and Michelle. So in, in your research, did you see a difference between movements that were centered around one person, like in the past, or did you see a difference in movements that center around an organization or more than one person? Yeah, so one of the characteristics of the of all of the organizations that we looked at is that they did have... Um, you know, some form of distributed leadership model where uh, we call, you know, we call the leaders on the ground distributed strategists, right? So even a, a lot of, a lot of different people were contributing ideas and leadership. Um, there were some orgs that had more, cent you know, had leaders that were more central. I would say New Virginia majority was one um, where they had an operative in the state house uh, that was, you know, very effective at kind of, um, you know, navigating, uh, you know, those those halls of power. And so she, um, you know, was was really influential. So I think it's one of we don't I don't think our research really answers that question of like, which is better. Um but we do have examples where, you know, the kind of um, having a having a more central leader can can be helpful um, for um, and in New Virginia majority's case, uh, helpful for minority groups uh, in particular to kind of get their their concerns uh, heard. Thank you for that. And, and for Liz, so a little questions in the chat is around the ecology of the types of organizing. And it was what type of uh, civic action does well or not so well and needs to be complemented or supplemented by other forms of organizing? This is a great question um, from Carmen. And I think it also combines a few of the other things that came up in the chat about um, leadership development. So related to the previous one as well, but I wanted to show a quick um, slide that I flipped through really quickly at the end to just try to um, give us a visualization of the different kind of typology or as the question actor said, different types of organizing um, that, that uh, organizations do. So one is sort of what we might think of as the electoral machine where there's a boom and a bust in even years. So you see this kind of light blue line at the top is influx of volunteers in 2016 and then a drop off in 17 and then an influx again in 2018. Um, another type of organizing or organization is what we might think of as like a mass action organization that does direct action, creates tension. I saw there was a question in the chat about the Floyd uprisings as well. So we might think of organizations that have maybe a small number of committed volunteers, but have big actions. This is data from an organization that was doing direct actions in response to um, ICE raids in Arizona. And then a third type of organization, um, this is Lucha's data, which is to answer the question about what these kinds of orgs do really well, it's the leadership development. So it's steady, sustained, structured growth over time of individual leaders who are doing that kind of strategizing work that um, Michelle and Tomas and Alex were talking about. But I wanna be really careful to say that it's not as though like one of these is better than the other. And so the question about ecology is really, really helpful. Um, so like I said, if we think about the mass uprisings in response to um, the murder of George Floyd, largest protests the United States had ever seen. These are, um, this is a map of the New York Times of where all those protests occur including in places and cities that were like 95% white. Um, and so uh, Joy Cushman, uh, one of our collaborators and movement leaders has a really interesting quote, I think about this where she says, the orgs that are building more power are able to wield different types of power. It's not all voting, it's not all civil disobedience. And I think the Arizona case is one of um, one of the most interesting ones that we looked at because it really is a movement. So in some of the other cases, we looked at a single anchor organization, but as Alex and Tomas described, they were part of an organizing ecology that grew up over the past 10 years and was able to have all of these wins at the municipal level, the state level, and then actually flipping the state in 2020. So um, we have a look, we have some data to like look at what it actually looks like to strategize, not just at the level of member members, but also in a movement, in a movement um, organization. So um, I don't know, Alex and Tomas, if you want me to show that grass, uh, graph of like what the state organizing looked like in 2006 versus 16, um, or we can just go to the next question because I know there were a lot of questions for you guys about how you actually do that leadership development. Yeah, so, um, we'll leave it up to the panel. We have more questions and then we can just go into a little bit without the... Yeah, we probably have, we're already <laughs> over time. 
Yeah, um, we, but we want to keep talking. So if um, we can just have one last quick question and then um, just a minute or two to wrap up. Yeah, so the last question, how do you come about uh, the process of building future leaders, but also learning as you go? Because as you mentioned, it is a hard practice to kind of play keep up and catch up, but also think about future strategies. Yeah, I'll jump in and throw to Alex real quick. I think in a super quick way to describe it is we have a lot of accountability measures in between and, and we take everyone from certain steps. And we, we learned this lesson a long time ago, which is never put a square peg in a round hole. And, and with staff, it's very similar. Like certain, just because a staff member is great at one thing doesn't mean that's where they're going to want to work in this movement. And you have to find where it fits for them along with their strengths. And, and um, yeah, and so I'll pass it to Alex to talk a little bit more in detail of it. Yeah, to, to dovetail off of what Tomas just said, um, we, we have a um, ladder of engagement for all of our members. Um, however, we create space to really identify and have conversations with our members to determine where they feel passion, where they feel called to lead. Um, and we engage them. Um, you know, at the level where they come in. And so most oftentimes we have been engaging folks that come in through a services component, but then they attend one of our actions and they're ready to take additional action. So it's a combination of relationship and being data-driven to be able to understand how many times has this person come out to an event? How many times has this person taken an online action or um, an offline action that come out to the state capitol and begin to lean on them a little bit more? Can you, um, you know, begin to organize folks in your community? And then that person takes additional leadership. And what we end up finding is that we then begin to onboard a lot of these leaders that take significant leadership within the organization. Um, and for us, what, what we're really also proud of is that we've had volunteers that have been with us since they were um, 14 and they stay with us. They'll go off to college and then they'll come back um, and they'll continue either organizing with us or volunteering with us. But it really does become a political home for, for our members, which creates consistency because these are also the people that are the messengers within communities. I'm really sorry to have to stop it there. Um, thank you all so much. This is, I mean, you can see from the chat room, it was so interesting and helpful um, for everyone involved. And um, Liz, Michelle, how can people keep up on the, the book and when it's released? Uh, if you order from the University of Chicago, our publisher website, I'm going to put a, code, a discount code on the chat. You get 20% off. But our, the date that we have is that the book will be in the warehouse June 18th. So hopefully we'll ship by July. Um, but here's the 20% off code um, if you order from the, the website, the just, Chicago website. Yeah. And just to, to um, mention, we do have another um, event a week from today at the same time about social movements going forward um, with um, labor, climate, gun violence, and immigration leaders. Um, and so that should be also really interesting. So sign up. Um, the link is uh, in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining.